So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Amy. I'm your host for today and also have been the host for the past uh, 28 um, months. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, we are very privileged that we have uh, Dr. Rajesh Singh, an orthopedic specialist of uh, Regan Healthcare, who's going to share on, um, is it necessary to have a knee surgery, which is a very uh, common question because uh, I have seen so many uh, clients, uh, friends and family that had knee issues. Okay, uh, at even at younger age as well. And there are always this question asking, you know, do I need to have a knee surgery? So without further delay, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Rajesh to uh, share and also um, to take questions later at the end of the sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh. Okay, um, thank you, Amy. Um, again, um, thanks to everyone for making the time. Um, this is going to be a relatively uh, informal kind of presentation. My aim is to give you guys some sort of concept or idea about what a joint is. I think one of the things that I want to get across is for you to correct some of your misunderstandings. And this question, it's quite sort of uh, topical that this uh, talk is brought to you by financial services provider. Because the way you make a decision in healthcare is the same as you make a decision in financial services, which is what is my investment, what is my risk, what is my reward, and then I calculate my yield. So in healthcare, it's actually uh, very much the same. So one of the very common things which we see in orthopedics, sports, chiropractic practice is knee pain. And a lot of patients will come in to me and ask the question, do I have to change my knee? And I can tell you the answer is nine out of 10 times, no, you don't have to change your knee. There are actually mechanisms and pathways for repair. It's just that they're not very popularized. They're not very well advertised. And the reason is because from the services provider's point of view, uh, you understand which one is more profitable. So we as a company, we've made our mission to basically try and get as many joints repaired as possible. Um, and if it can't be repaired, we'll tell you, look, it can't be repaired, you're not suitable, then you'll need a replacement. So let's go on to the next page. Let's see if I can do this. Um, page down, there you go. Okay, so that's me. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, just so who, you know whom you're talking to. And our mission here is to avoid major orthopedic surgery. I used to do major orthopedic surgery. Uh, about 15 years ago, but I've sort of generally realized that you can avoid it and you can actually repair a lot of stuff. Um, I graduated with honors from the University of New South Wales in Australia, and I've also got my master's in orthopedic surgery with distinction from the University of Malaya. Um, it may interest you to know that I'm a founding member of the Multidisciplinary International Association of Musculoskeletal Pain. So that's one of the things, one of the concepts that we're going to talk about, we're going to sort of draw the line between orthopedic and musculoskeletal. So if you ask yourself, well, what's the difference? Um, it's just like in financial terms, you know, there's debits and credits, depending on whether you're the bank or whether you're the provider or whether you're the customer, right? So it's the same thing, just kind of different names. Uh, but basically, if you talk about orthopedics, generally, you're talking about bones and joints. If you talk about musculoskeletal, and you're welcome to have a look at that link there, um, it's actually the reason why I agreed to be a founding member of this organization is because it's multidisciplinary. There's all sorts of different medical specialties. There's rheumatologists, anesthetists, pain physicians, sports physicians, uh, radiologists, myself as an orthopedic surgeon. We have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, rehab physicians, chiropractors. So there's a lot of people who are involved in this sort of very community-based um, organization. So let's ask the first question, what is a joint? And I thought to myself when I was doing the setup, sort of setup for this talk, and I said, well, what can I expect the public to reasonably know? Um, I can expect the public to reasonably know what's on Wikipedia. So I just took a quick snapshot um, from a page in Wikipedia. And I want you to understand, I want you to just point a few things. I want to just point a few things out to you. The first thing is that the definition of a joint is where two bones meet, bone number one and bone number two, they meet. And there has to be a specialized structure that allows moving where two bones meet. So that is a joint, right? So what are the components of the joint? Well, the first component of the joint obviously has to be the bone. 
The second component of the joint that you can see here is the articular cartilage. Then there's the third component of the joint called the bursa. Number four, the synovial cavity. Number five, the joint capsule. Number six, the tendon. Number seven, the enthesis. Number eight, the ligament. Number nine, the epiphyseal bone. Number 10, the flexor muscle. And what's not shown here is the nerve. So there are 10 components simplistically that go into forming a joint. Now, this is what's called a synovial joint. They are sort of the big joints in the body. So for your purposes, you can say every joint other than the spine. So the spine has a couple of different structures. The spine has this thing called a disc of fibrocartilage, as well as a ligament here. So there's a couple of more things. So you'd say that for the spine, it's 10 plus one. For all other joints, it's just 10. So I want you to hold the number in your mind. I want you to think about the number 10. And I want you to understand that any of these 10 things can cause pain in and around a joint. So I've done a whole BFM series. Uh, so if you Google my name, Dr. Rajesh Singh BFM, you'll find a whole BFM series that I've done on causes of joint pain. So joint pain doesn't equal arthritis. I'll say that again. Pain around a joint doesn't equal arthritis. So that's a really fundamental concept that you have to have. So in a regular joint like a knee, which is what we're talking about today, there are 10 potential causes of pain. And in the spine, there's a plus one. So there's 11 potential causes of pain when you have pain around the joint. So that then asks the next question, how come everybody says that the pain comes when the cartilage is worn out? Common question, right? If I tell you there are 10 individual components, how come everybody says that one component is the cause of the pain? And the answer is largely misdirection. In the old days, before we had more sophisticated tools for imaging, the only thing that you had was an X-ray, the same one that you used to look at broken bones. So using the X-ray, you could look at the surface of the joint next to another bone. So there would be another bone here. And you could say, well, you know, this gap is a bit reduced. So this is one of the potential causes. Yes, absolutely. Loss of cartilage is one of the potential causes, but it is only one of 10. It is not 10 of 10. And I think if you leave this talk with nothing else, that's the thing you must leave this talk with, that the cartilage is only one of 10 potential causes of your pain. So if you're going to go for a knee replacement surgery, basically you're going to chop all 10 components and throw them out and replace them with metal and plastic. Well, nine out of those 10 components may be working well. Only one component may be spot. I understand from Amy that most of our participants today are over 40. So I just want to talk about this general concept of level of function against age. So 30 years of age, which most of our participants are past, is the prime of skeletal health. And all of us here, including myself now on this slow, downward decline. The green is independent, robust function. So that means you can do all your housework. You can go climbing. You know, you can go trekking. You can go long holidays, no joint pain. Very good. Activities of daily living means that you can do what you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe with some pain and stiffness. And then dependent means that you can't do things by yourself. You need help already. So most of the time, people are increasingly seeing me at this range here when they go, look, my independent robust function is getting less. I used to be able to do a lot. Now I can do less. And so they come and seek help. But there is a line here called start of accelerated functional decline. And for women, this line basically corresponds with menopause. So I'll see lots of women perimenopause within the two years of the menopause. They come in and they go, you know, I was good until whatever age, 30, you know, late 30s, early 40s and suddenly things are starting to fall apart for me. And that's usually in relation to menopause. The reason is because musculoskeletal tissues behave like rubber band. And if you say musculoskeletal tissues, it's anything with collagen in it, including skin. So muscle, tendon, ligament, fascia, bursa, enthesis, bone. So these are all components of your joint. Anything that has collagen in it, if you pull too hard on a new rubber band, it'll break, that's injury in the young. You pull normally on a nicked rubber band, which is injury in the middle age. And of course you pull softly on an old rubber band. 
pretty intuitive, right? So if you leave the rubber band in the car for a long time and you pull on it, even though the rubber band's relatively new, then the rubber band breaks or cracks quite easily. So musculoskeletal tissues basically have a rubber-like property. And as the tissues get damaged, the rubber-like property becomes more plastic-like. As a result, you get the final common pathway for injury, which is inflammation. So this slide actually represents um, the ancient Greek understanding of inflammation. So there is heat, calor, redness, rubro, swelling, dolor, pain, and loss of function, functio dilatio. So these are actually old terms from Greek times. They actually knew about inflammation. That's why inflammation can be acute, chronic, or episodic. So that's why if you have knee pain, you go to your GP, they'll always give you anti-inflammatory medications. And the reason why they give you anti-inflammatory medications is because the final common pathway for injury to all 10 structures I showed you is inflammation. And the inflammation can happen once and stop. It can happen all the time, or it can come, go, come, go, come, go. So that's called episodic. This is the concept that we have at Region regarding how we look at skeletal health. We say that you have brittle rubber bands, which causes loss of function and deconditioning. So loss of function, you can understand deconditioning means that you don't exercise or you don't practice the thing for a long time, you forget how to do it, or you do it very poorly. That then causes secondary changes and symptoms, which can be compounded by medical issues and it can compound medical issues. So I have patients who say, my knee hurts and is swollen and I have diabetes. I can't exercise because my knee hurts because I don't exercise to put on weight. My diabetes is worse than my knee hurts some more. High blood pressure, hormone issues, smoking fatty liver, all of these things contribute to secondary changes and symptoms. And when you have these things, you complete the cycle here of brittle rubber bands. So how do we approach this? From brittle rubber bands to loss of function, we do what are called image guided procedures. So these are procedures which are minor surgeries done under local anesthetic where you don't have to be put to sleep, you don't have to be cut open. And these reverse the loss of function and deconditioning. Once we reverse or we break this connection here, then we do guided physiotherapy. And that's one of the principal advantages that Region has. We have a same page for both physiotherapists and for myself. So I'm supported by a staff of 12 physiotherapists who literally will sit down with me in the clinic, will see me do treatments and will understand what needs to happen. We share care with general practitioners. So if you know any general practitioners who are interested in this model, who want to share care with us, we're very happy to do that. And they will help you to look after these things here. And they will continue to look after you to see that you don't have brittle rubber bands. So as I said before, the most promising thing, if we come up to this slide over here, is to break this line in the cycle. Injury leading to loss of function and deconditioning leading to secondary changes and symptoms. So if we can break the cycle, basically you can actually recondition very well. So the way we break that cycle is we use image guided procedures and the imaging modality we use is ultrasound. All women who've had babies will know exactly what this is. It's the same technology, but we use it for musculoskeletal tissues. So that means for muscle, tendon, ligament, nerve, fascia, meniscus, all of those things. And we aim to provide a diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment all in one. So when you come to see us, you don't do the ping pong. You don't see the doctor, go get an imaging, wait, come back another day. We do everything on the spot. So we give you a one-stop sort of solution. This is an example of somebody who, had, who would have shoulder pain. This is what the ultrasound examination would look like. This is what I would see under the ultrasound. The top layer is skin. The bottom layer here is bone. And these are all tissues in between. And this is an instrument coming in. And that instrument is actually going to cut some scar, which is causing an impediment of shoulder function. So this is a treatment for a frozen shoulder, for example. So the treatment is done without general anesthetic. It's done under local anesthetic. The size of this instrument is 1.8 millimeters, right? That's under 2 millimeters. 
And the procedure itself is done as daycare. So you come in in the morning, do your procedure, go back the same day. You can use the part immediately. There's no need for crutches, no need for rest, uh, no need for downtime. So assuming we've done all that and you have rehabilitated through, then you need an exercise plan. And our physiotherapist, after you've finished the acute phase of rehabilitation, will give you an exercise plan. And this is to prevent you from developing further problems. And there is a formula for an exercise plan. And if you have an injury, so this is sort of general advice for anybody who has an injury and to maintain your musculoskeletal health, you should exercise. But if you have an injury, you should treat it well once. I see lots of people with recurrent ankle sprains. They say, yeah, you know, three or four times a year, I sprain my ankle, then it's really painful. Um, and it's been going on for the last three years. Well, you need to recognize that things are not getting better you need to consider exactly what the problem is. And that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on. We pride ourselves on giving you a tissue diagnosis. We will tell you your ligament by this name, your tendon by that name, your nerve by this name is the problem and what the problem that involves it is. And we can treat it with minimally invasive procedures, guided expert physiotherapy. And I say guided expert physiotherapy because Lots of physiotherapy in Malaysia is basically a cookie cutter experience, right? So you go in, they put a hot pack, they put some machines on you, they go away, they play on their handphone, and then after 45 minutes, they come back. We don't do that. Our physiotherapy is like sitting one-on-one -on -one with a personal trainer and being able to recognize what your deficiency is and how it needs to be corrected. And some of my physiotherapists are actually experts in musculoskeletal ultrasound as well. So I've trained them and their skills are very, very good. And of course, optimization of medical problems. You know, if you are not committed to fixing your diabetes, not committed to controlling your diet, not committed to changing your lifestyle, it's very hard for us to optimize you. So rice, I just want to highlight rest, ice, compression, elevation. We use this commonly after treatment and people always wonder why. It's because it rice stops inflammation. So I said inflammation is the final common pathway. If you have an injury, you should use rice and not the eating variety. It's rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So these are the helpful tips, recommendations for treatment. See someone with an interest. See the same person repeatedly. You know, I see patients have been to see five different people before they come and see me. That's usually not a bad, not a good sign because it means that they're not, well, either that person whom they've seen don't have an interest or they're doctor shopping. Uh, don't come all your... Don't collect all your symptoms and come in once. So sometimes patients will see me and they'll tell me, you know, my knee's been hurting for three years. My back's been hurting for one year. Now my sh shoulder started hurting for six months. And now when I decide to do something about it, you know. If you're diabetic and you see me, I'll ask you about this number called the HbA1c. The HbA1c is your average sugar test for the last three months. If you don't know your HbA1c, by definition, you have poor understanding of your diabetes control. So these are all factors that we consider in treating people. So what I'd like to do now is, let me just go through a couple of cases with you because people find this sometimes a little bit abstract. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you some x-rays. Um, let me just get this one over here. Let's go to x-ray. Okay, great. So this is something that's very common um, that people will see. So can you see the x-ray there, Amy? Yes, yes, I can. Great. So let me just run through this x-ray with you and explain to you. So this is a lady. She's probably in her late 60s. She came to see me brought by her son and daughter. And her complaint is that when she sits down for her right knee, when she sits down for a long time, she tries to get up. It's very difficult for her to get up. Right. So she has and she can't squat on the floor anymore. Or when she's going downstairs, it's very difficult. So she brought in this x-ray and she was told that she needs to have this knee changed. She needs a knee replacement. And she said, the doctor said to her, look at this part here, right? This bone is rubbing this bone. So the friction on the bone is causing the pain. Now I said, look, let's just stop and think about it. If the friction on the bone is causing the pain, how come you have pain when you're sleeping at night? How come you have pain when you're trying to sit down to stand, but after you've taken five or 10 steps, you've got no more pain or your pain is less? That's illogical, right? So the problem when you do an x-ray or even an MRI is that you only see one or two of the 10 potential causes of pain. 
So with this lady, using the technologies we have in musculoskeletal ultrasound, I can tell you that her pain was coming from the tendons outside the knee joint, as well as for her in particular, an entrapment of the nerve that occurred about here based on these bone spurs. So these bone spurs at the back were actually impinging on the nerve. And so her pain was coming from tendon and nerve, not from joint. So she didn't need a knee replacement. She just needed it repaired. So let me just show you what that looks like. So let's go over here. Okay. So what you can see here is a couple of very interesting things. This leg isn't painful. It looks straight. This leg is painful. It looks bored. Right? And this is her sitting down with her feet up on a stool and me taking the picture from the bottom. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because the problem that she has isn't actually a bow, it's actually a bend. So let's go over here and let's go to pre-FFD. Here you go. So if you look here, this knee goes up like that and then comes down like that. So the knee is actually bent. And if you go back to the x-ray, you can actually see on the x-ray that the knee is bent. So this x-ray was taken with this lady standing up, right? So this is one bone, this is another bone. This knee is bent by a lot of degrees. This, this bone down here should be coming straight here. So her problem is what's called a flexion deformity. It means that the soft tissues around the knee have made it such that she can't straighten the knee. Because she can't straighten the knee, this part of the cartilage gets overloaded. So the analogy I always give is if you have a car tire and your car tire is out of alignment, one side has to get worn out first. So what you can do is you can correct the alignment of the tire. Once you correct the alignment of the tire, the tire doesn't last forever, but it lasts for as long as it was supposed to last. So that concept is very important. So let's go back to here to get the pre. So in the pre, her knee is bent. And after treatment, let me just show you. After treatment, the knee is straight. So what I've done is I've come to the other side now to look at the left knee compared to the right knee. And this is all she has. She just has light dressings. These dressings can come off after four hours. Let me see if I've got this picture from you from this side. Perfect. So here, this bone lines up straight with the other bone. There is no bend that there was with the previous picture. So the concept here is this lady came in with, for all intents and purposes, a knee which needed a knee replacement based on conventional wisdom. But she's 60 plus, she lives with her family. Um, she doesn't do any heavy housework. She has no ambitions to you know, increase her function by 200%. She doesn't want to go to a Great Wall of China every year. She doesn't want to go you know, walk in the mall for 10 hours at a time. She just wants go to toilet, no pain, stand up, go walk, no pain, go shopping with the children, no pain, be able to independently move around the household and contribute a little bit to the household, which can be achieved very successfully with image guided procedures. So that means no need to sleep, no need to cut, no general anesthetic, no downtime. And the dressings come off after about four hours. But it's not magic, yeah? Not everybody is suitable for this. Um, a few characteristics that made this lady suitable. Let's see if this one will work. Okay, so a few characteristics that made this lady suitable. She had already done activity modifications. She was already using a walking stick. You can see here when she's trying to get up that she has to push herself off using her hands because knees, this knee is weak. So our, pat, our sort of format is to say, Minimal invasive treatment plus physiotherapy equals significant improvement in quality of life without total knee replacement. And so the main advantage that of this sort of model is it's not the highest value model. So I told you at the start that you take the investing concept, right? The yield for this is astronomically high because no general anesthetic, no cut to the skin. If you're not diabetic and you don't smoke cigarettes, risk in 20,000 procedures is zero. Success rate, 92%. And I've had failures. You know, I'm happy to say I treat 100 people, 92 are satisfied, eight are not satisfied. 
and the eight are not satisfied, usually because their expectation was not reasonable. So my most dissatisfied patient to date was a Dato who came from Tamantun. <coughs> he came to me in a wheelchair. After I treated him, after he did his physiotherapy, he came back and he said, I'm not happy with your treatment. So I thought, okay, why? He said, I cannot play 18 holes of golf. I can only play nine holes of golf. So to me, that was, you may laugh and you may say, well, look, that's an unreasonable individual, but patients don't know what we can achieve for them. So for us as providers, that's made the lesson very clear for me to say that I have to ask people what is their expectation. And sometimes the expectation is clear. Little old lady having difficulty walking comes in with a woman who's pregnant maybe seven months. Why suddenly is pregnant at seven months come to see me? Because some more two months baby going to come. <laughs> so knees need to be fit to look after baby for two months, right? So there are certain stereotype patterns of people who come to see me. Uh, lots of my Muslim patients will come to see me when they can't pray properly. They've got this position called uh, Dudu Antara Dua Sujud where they have to fold their knees back fully. So when they lose the ability to pray together on a Friday, that's a big thing for them. So they come and see me. And their expectation is whatever else you do, I must be able to do that. Um, some people I don't treat, like some badminton players I don't treat because I say, your addiction, I cannot cure. So even though I fix your knee, you go play badminton, you will spoil it again. Um, so some, the assessment of what the patient needs is very, very important because the, the, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? But when your investment is small, uh, you're looking for yield is a bit higher. When your investment is big, so let's say that I, let's say somebody has a total knee surgery, right? They go to sleep, they get cut open, they have the risk and then the knee surgery fail. They're very unhappy, but they're sort of accepted. They go, oh, wow, big surgery already didn't work. Right, so uh, I used to do knee replacement surgeries. Um, the reason why I stopped is quite a long story, so I won't bore you with that. Uh, um, but I feel that with this model, even if 50% of people who are going to have a knee replacement, my number is 90% now, but even if 50% of people who are going to have a knee replacement can avoid a knee replacement, that's a significant uh, reduction in their financial costs, uh, both for them as well as for the insurance system that's a significant reduction in body risk and body cost uh, for them as well. So that's basically what we're here to promote and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Rajas. Dr. Rajas, back to this picture, uh, you mentioned that this lady, uh, she, what, what was the treatment that you did uh, for her, that the dressing? Okay, so the treatment which I did, let me just go back to my slides. Um, this is my slides. Hang on, let me just get to my slides. Okay, and let's get to this slide over here. Okay, yeah. so what I did for her was the cause of pain was the tendon sticking to the bursa, then the bursa sticking to the synovial cavity. So the consequence of chronic, in so as I said to you, chronic inflammation is the final common pathway. So the consequence of chronic inflammation is scar. And you can see that in anybody who has a skin condition, psoriasis, for example, you keep getting inflammation in the skin, you get scar of the skin. Uh, people know that if you get inflammation of the liver, you get scar of the liver, inflammation of the lungs, scar of the lungs, so on and so on. So when you have scar of tendon onto lining, onto synovial cavity, these things cause pain. So what we do is basically we give an anesthetic to numb the area. I take a very thin, long instrument and I pass the instrument between the layers and I cut the scar between the layers. So all I'm doing is I'm returning your body to its original shape. Okay, so the example I always give is, let's say that you're, you're the back of your hands, you injure the back of your hands and then you tie them together. Yep. The hands stick to each other. Every day you tear apart the hands to be able to move. And then at night, you tie them back together again. Eventually, they can't move. They become very stiff. And that's the main uh, complaint that people have. They'll say it is stiff or they will say it is that shin tone that they just can't really pick up exactly where the thing is. And another very strong symptom is they will say that they've gone to Tita and the Tita said that things are stuck inside. They've done the massage. It gets better for a while because the Tita does the same thing that I do. He tries to separate the tissue layers but he can't access the inside. He can only access the outside. 
So as you mentioned that uh, it's a very short, simple procedure on a local uh, anesthetic. Yes. yes. How long would this um, reoccur again? I mean, would it last this relief? Okay, good question. So I'll answer some common questions that people ask in the format they ask it, right? First question they ask, is it safe? Answer is yes, in an audit of 20,000 procedures, if you're well-controlled diabetic and you don't smoke, complication rate is zero. Is it effective? Yes, all comers, same audit, 20,000 procedures, success rate is 92%. Does it come back? Answer is yes, if you don't do physiotherapy. Recurrence rate without physiotherapy is about 30% in one year. Recurrence rate with, recurrence rate with physiotherapy, about 2%. Okay. Which is so if I have an ongoing uh, physiotherapy. No, no, the on the physiotherapy is only for the first probably about four weeks for you to relearn how to break your bad habit cycle. And the bad habit cycle is over here. So I do this part here where you get loss of function and deconditioning, and the physiotherapist correct the secondary changes and symptoms. And then you stay, this cycle doesn't happen again. to correct the uh, the bad habits that form when the knee was uh, yeah, bent. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And when the knee is bent, what happens is lots of people will complain about pain. So this lady as well, what she complained about was she complained about pain in the hamstrings muscles and the hamstrings muscles are over here. Yep. And the reason is because the tendons are actually coming from the buttock. They come over here, they cross and they go onto the inside of the knee. So if you have joint cartilage pain, the pain should be here. Her pain yep. was down here. So that's actually tendon pain, not joint pain. Not joint pain. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for uh, your sharing. So uh, to our attendees who just joined us, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type into the, uh, the chat box. Okay. And now we shall answer uh, the question that we have. Uh, we will go to the questions from our attendees that have put into the registration form. Um, doctor, what is the main cause of knee injury? Uh, let's go over here. From this slide, it is not getting younger. <laughs> All right. So it's aging. Aging is the main cause. Yeah, but aging is the main cause because of these things. So the problem with all skeletal tissues is that it behaves like rubber band. So one of the common things, one of the other common things that people come in with is they come in with an MRI. And they say that the MRI shows a meniscus tear. And then they've been recommended for surgery to repair the meniscus tear. If they're lucky, yep. they come see me before the surgery or after the surgery when they're still painful, then they come and see me. And what they misunderstand is that, so a meniscus is like a grape. If you have a meniscus in a young person, you squeeze the grape, the skin tears. A meniscus injury in an older person, older here being over 50, is like an override grip. You have an override grip, you squeeze right. it, the juice comes out of the pulp. Yep. So they're fundamentally different things, but the MRI cannot distinguish. The ultrasound can distinguish. Okay. So that is the main reason um, that would answer the main cause of knee injury. Which Doctor, is, how, yep. Sorry, age and down here, which is deconditioning and secondary changes. So it's the, the habits, I guess, is uh, yep. formed during over the years. All right. Um, how long can a knee, new knee replacement last? Okay, um, I'll answer this question the way it's supposed to be answered, right? So most of the time, public will come to me and say five years, 10 years, 15 years, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not how we calculate it. We calculate it on survivorship. So that means that if a thousand knee replacements are done, how many are still intact after five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? So that means that a properly done knee replacement, five year survivorship is close to 100%. So if I treat 1,000 people with a knee replacement in five years, all 1,000, the knee is functioning well. Then you get to 10 years and the number drops off. 15 years, number drops off. 20 years, number drops off. So it's very hard to give a public the sense of how long should it last? Because patients come to you and say, this doctor say 15 years, this mm -hmm. doctor say 10 years, this doctor say 20 years. It is The reason for the confusion is because the data cannot be collected like that. The data cannot be collected to say this knee replacement lasts 20 years. The, the correct data will be to say that in a thousand people with this knee replacement, at the end of 20 years, 50% is still intact. Very confusing for the public, right? So they want a simplified answer. Uh, no simplified answer, only complicated answer. I guess also uh, with the, like as you mentioned, you know, physiotherapy to change the habit uh, from being, you know, 
bad to good that also help with uh, no no the the thing the thing i find with the thing i find with knee replacement is that if it's done for the wrong reason then you still have pain so lots of patients i've said to you that there are 10 potential tissues which can cause pain in the knee the yep. knee replacement is very good for cartilage but what if your main source of pain is actually tendon what if your main source of pain is actually um, the entheses? So I've seen patients who've come in with poor knee replacement results, and it's because the, the main source of pain isn't the cartilage. Okay. Okay. So if that is done, um, the knee replacement that was done beforehand, it did not help at all because the pain still persists. Correct. Because the pain source is not from cartilage. It is from somewhere else in this matrix. Okay, our next question that we have, is it safe for elderly people of 80 plus years old to undergo knee replacement surgery? Uh, okay, so there's a chronological age, meaning that, you know, what it says on your IC, but that also depends on when your birth is registered and whether you calculate by English calendar or lunar calendar. Um, and then there's the physiological age, that means what is the condition of your heart, what is the condition of your lung, what is the condition of your muscle, um, a general gauge is how young do they look. If they're 80 and they look 60, then okay. If they're 80 and they look 90, then no. Okay. So meaning that uh, at a younger age, uh, if physiologically yes. they are healthy, so it's, it's okay, still okay, provided they need, need a knee replacement. Correct. Okay. Um, next question. I am 60 year old. Uh, am I still okay to hike? I'm a hiker. Okay. So the answer is, what are all 10 of these components doing? And I get I get questions like that very commonly. So they'll say, oh, my knee has got a little bit of noise and they think that noise can only come from cartilage. Noise can actually also come from tendons. So the example I give for that is if you have a leather jacket or leather skirt and you keep it in the cupboard for a little while and then you take it out and use it, it makes noise. It's squeaky and it creaks. And, you know, there's no cartilage in the leather. It's all just, you know, the same stuff that tendons are made of. So noise can actually also come from tendons. So my answer there is, if your muscle bulk is very good and you have no injury to any of these other structures and you have no secondary changes, if you have no secondary changes, then yes, you should keep hiking. It's good for your health. Okay. All right. Hope that answers uh, our hiker uh, attendee today. Uh, next question that we have is, uh, occasionally my knees weaken and give way. Sometimes I can hear cracking, cracking sound. What is the remedy other than operation? Um, the remedy is basically to correct the flexion deformity. So the reason why your knee is giving way is because you've gone past this critical angle here. So this critical angle is 15 degrees. Once you're more than 15 degrees, your knee will buckle. And the example for that is you see children in the playground, somebody will go behind them and push the other first knee from the back. And then the guy suddenly falls down. He falls down because in order to sort of, if your knee is bent, you can't lock it straight. So your knee has to go straight and this thing called a screw hole mechanism where it locks. So when your knee is bent, you can't have the screw hole mechanism. So you will find that the knee is unstable. So you need to be able to correct that deformity by whatever means. Once you correct the deformity, then the give way will become less. And how about the sound, the creaking sound that it happens? The Okay, the creaking sound may be from cartilage, may be from tendon. That one need to assess and see. If it's from, I would guesstimate that it's probably from tendon because she's already gone past the critical angle of 15 degrees. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, the reply for this question is uh, to get it assessed to understand further on what's yes. the cognition. And, and also to prevent further damage because if, just like your car tire, if at 15 degrees you correct your alignment, the tire lasts a long time. That's right. If you don't correct the alignment, then tire makan fast. Then yeah, have to right, tire. That's right. Okay, next question we have. Does taking glucosamine so far in long run increases my sugar levels? Is this harmful to the body generally? What are the side effects, if any? Okay. Um, this is a very politically sensitive question, right? So I have to be very careful how I answer it. The evidence that I have is that glucosamine reduces joint pain as effectively as Panadol. That's the objective evidence I have. Um, and that's also why in a lot of countries where medicine is paid for by the government like Canada, Australia, and other countries, a lot of these things are not available on the formulary. 
because you have to be clear what mechanism, what is the mechanism by which they reduce pain? Because I said there are 10 potential sources of pain, right? Which is the main source of your pain? Then you have to make sure that you're treating that. So glucosamine question, a little bit sensitive. Mm. So I don't want to answer too many things because too many people have vested interests. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, next question that we have also from a hiker. After hiking, sometimes pain felt on the left side of the knee. How to prevent it? Second question, does swimming helps to prevent knee pain? And a third question, does soaking our legs and foot in warm water with Epsom salt really helps? I did okay, it often so, after my hike. Okay, so I go three to one. Uh, three, yes, if, it's, if you do something and it relieves your pain, then okay, look, it's completely harmless. Um, question two is... Swimming, swimming. swimming. Swimming is actually, yes, swimming is by far the best possible exercise that you can do to alleviate knee pain. Because if you take my car example again, I told you that this is like your tire alignment. The cartilage is like the tread of your tire. This muscle is like your shock absorber. So if you can build up your shock absorber, although your alignment may not be so good, but your cartilage is protected. Right, so and swimming is a very good exercise because you can build up the shock absorber without loading the tire. So that's the general concept. Uh, and question number one, uh, got pain? Don't know, Masila. I don't know how to tell you what. Yeah. So I guess if any uh, patients or any of our attendees have any pain, I think the best thing is actually to get access to see which are the areas that's causing the pain. I think the best thing is to rise first. So you go through the rest ice uh, compression elevation. So if you have knee pain, then we assume that you have a knee injury and you do this first. So don't use hot mm. pack. Use this, okay. right? If after this still got pain, then you can consider whether you want to come and see the physios. The problem with physios is, other than my physios, it's a little bit hard for me to, to vouch for them. So come and see the physios. If the physios cannot settle or you need to use insurance or whatever, then you come and see me first. So that's very good advice. So... Um, for those who uh, did not manage to catch a picture for rice, okay, I think you should uh, do that. Uh, if doctor can put the uh, rice, uh, I think th the rice is very good. Right, here. Yes, uh, here. Okay, recommendation for injury. So do this first. It doesn't work. See a few therapy. It still doesn't work. Then see Dr. Uh, Rajesh. Okay, next question that we have is, what causes a pull at the kneecap? Okay, let's go back to my favorite model picture again. You see how this knee is bent? The yep. kneecap is sitting here and there's a tendon that holds the kneecap down here. This tendon is chronically overloaded when you can't straighten your knee. So you get, so if they mean a pulling here, number one, or they mean a pulling here, number two, or this location on the other side as well, right? Those are all tendon issues. Very common, very unrecognized. And you know you don't need an X-ray machine or CT scan or MRI. You just need your eyeball and to rec to accept to appreciate that this leg is not straight. And the minute the leg is not straight, it's like your car tire out of alignment. Then you get all the associated problems. Okay. Okay. So um, it's to look at your eyes to see whether it's not straight. If it's the cause would be is it because of the the way of the tendon is being you know pulled? That's In why that. Inflammation. In, inflammation causes scar. Scar causes bad habit. Bad habit causes inflammation. Inflammation causes scar. Okay, so the cycle just keep on going and that's when the pain persists. Correct. Okay. So next question that we have. Uh, doctor, I'm an active person who likes to walk and sometimes jog, but when night, uh, my knees ache, knees and ankle ache. In 100%. addition, I took thermosifen. How do I deal with this pain? Okay. So this is actually very interesting that you say that. Uh, you're, so you're clearly a woman because you're taking the tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is an anti-estrogen agent. And mm -hmm. I said to you that in women, there's a point in the graph where they will suddenly go downhill. And that point in the graph is basically menopause, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the start of accelerated function decline. So I see this a lot with people who have had cancer. The reason why they have ankle and knee pain is basically because the pain is coming from tendon source. So if I go over here, there, so this thing called, uh, this is a muscle, let's look for a tendon. 
Where's my tendon? Okay, this is my tendon over here, right? So this tendon is supposed to have an independent lining separate from the bursa. If you have chemotherapy or estrogen withdrawal, these two surfaces get stuck together very, very fast. So when they get stuck together, it's like you rubbing two surfaces when you walk. So that's why when they walk, no symptom. At the end of the day, when they stop, then the symptom come and next day it's worse or it's stiff, right? So that is something that, that, is something that we treat very commonly. If you separate the two layers, the symptoms disappear and they don't come back, right? But then you need to rehabilitate the tendon a little bit. Um, this is probably, the, the, the message for cancer survivors is probably very, very important because cancer medication causes scarring of mm -hmm. lots of different tissues. And some of them will say they've had the medication put in the vein, now they cannot find the vein anymore. Well, mm -hmm. they cannot find the vein anymore because the medication causes scarring of the vein, vein is shut down. Similarly, it causes scarring of lots of nerves in the body. And they are told that your nerve symptom is coming because the medication poisoned the nerve. That is not true in all cases. In a lot of cases, the medication causes scar around the nerve, then the nerve gets squashed. Then you get nerve symptoms. And in those people, if you separate the scar and you free the nerve, the quality of life improves very dramatically. Okay. All right. So I guess uh, that that actually is a, is a is a new learning for me because as you mentioned that the medication and also the uh, especially with cancer patients they have that okay um, next question that we have here is um, okay my knee is inflamed and hurts at the side when I walk having done uh, six physiotherapy sessions pain has reduced somewhat. I also take Celebrex to reduce inflammation. The swell has gone down subsequently, but it's still present. What can I do? Would glucosamine help? Uh, so the short answer is no, because you're here. The final common pathway for injury. So yours is acute episodic inflammation. So that means it comes, you take the medication, it goes. So what the physiotherapy, what your medication has done is it's basically... Uh, stop some inflammation. So it's not here. It stopped inflammation, but it cannot break the cycle. So the physiotherapy has controlled your secondary changes and symptoms, but you have scar causing, scar plus activity cause inflammation. Medication stop the inflammation, but scar still there. So for as long as scar is still there, you rub, you get inflamed again. So that one probably... Uh, get you know come come see us. I think this is probably the case where we can make the most difference to quality of life, because if you treat early, you resolve completely. Ah, that would be amazing. Okay, for our um, registered attendee today. Uh, next question that we have uh, from now we've completed all the uh, the question in our registration form. So now we are moving on to our chat box. Uh, can the ultrasound procedure and reconditioning be done for trigger finger? Yes. Um, and it is actually funny that you bring that up because trigger finger is like, to me, trigger finger is like saying fever. Got many causes of fever, got dengue, got Ebola, got SARS, got COVID, got infection, got tumor, got many, many causes of trigger finger. A lot of the time, women will come and see me having done like four or five trigger finger operations and they say, my hand is still stiff. And the reason is because they miss the underlying diagnosis, which is brittle tendons usually due to menopause causes inflammation causes yep. scar then the scar causes the trigger so yes image guided procedure and physiotherapy will not only cure it it'll improve quality of life very significantly because you can have a light hand so a lot of women will come in and say every morning i get up i got to struggle to move my hands once i move my hands then only the rest of the day is okay so the short answer to that is yes okay so the uh, conditioning and also, uh, like you mentioned earlier, what about uh, tennis elbow? Because she also added in tennis elbow as well. Okay, so tennis elbow, I would see, so this is sort of a bit interesting, right? Uh, let me see if I can get a reference for you. Okay, don't have, but let's, let's imagine this. The muscle tendon form a unit of work. If you have compression of a nerve that supplies the muscle, the muscle tendon unit becomes weak and the muscle tendon unit then spoils and gets overloaded. So in my experience, when somebody comes in with tennis elbow, everybody is treating the muscle tendon unit. Nobody is asking the root cause, why did they have tennis elbow in the first place? Yeah. So what I tend to do is I tend to look a little bit higher and I tend to look at where the nerve compression is that is causing weakness of the muscle tendon unit, then that causes the tennis elbow. 
if you treat the nerve compression that causes the weakness, then the tennis elbow goes away by itself and never comes back. Okay. All right. So I, I guess the best thing is actually to get access. Then the, the patient will understand better what's causing the pain. Uh, next question, Dr. Rajesh, do you have a clinic in Penang? I guess our attendees from Penang. Okay. Uh, my parents are in Penang, so I go to Penang a lot, by and the past. Uh, <laughs> answer is part okay so I explain fair, fair question and I explain why we don't I get this question from um, Johor I get this question uh, from Penang I get this question from Ipoh and the reason is because I cannot function independently I need a group of physiotherapists to work with because my model is minimally invasive procedure plus physiotherapy so if you have access to a group of physiotherapists who are happy to work together with me, please, you know, maybe, maybe Amy, join the dots. But we want to work with people who really understand what the concepts are, the basic mechanisms of disease, and not just formula. You know, you have ABC ingredients, you get ABC dish. We want to look at principles, and based on principles, then we want to treat. Um, a very common question people always ask me is, how come when I go to see an orthopedic surgeon, they always say it must need operation? Okay, the answer is when you go to fish shop, cannot buy chicken, only go fish. So you have to see which shop you go to before you see what you want to buy. Okay, all right. So uh, our Penang attendees, uh, not yet, the answer is not yet. Huh? Dr. Raj, I just don't have a clinic there yet. <laughs> okay, uh, next question that we have, I have leg cramp three to four times a night while I'm having deep sleep. Cramp pain until I wake up. Why? Uh, what causes this? And I can't squat down. Yeah. Okay, uh, the, this one, there are about 200 causes of cramps. So if you just give me that information, hard to say. If you tell me can't squat down, then they say 90% coming from tendon inflammation. You irritate the tendon. So just over here, you irritate the tendon. The tendon is connected to the muscle. Then the muscle goes into spasm because the tendon is inflamed and irritated. So answer is the pain's probably coming from tendon and the muscle spasm secondary. So that's something that I see commonly. And if you tell me that your complaint is can't squat down or can squat down, but cannot get up then almost 100% coming from the tendon. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, next question that we have, Dr. Rajesh, do you treat lower back problem? It has caused the left buttock to be painful while I sit too long. Is there yeah. a physical treatment for this at your center? Okay. Um, buttock. So now with working from home, I actually see lots of very interesting buttock problems, which are wrongly ascribed to the back. So the short answer is yes, we'd be very interested in seeing you because we can pick up things a lot of people can't. Most of the time you'll do an MRI, MRI will say slip disc and then somebody will say to you major operation or put up with the pain. But if we can assess that your pain is truly coming from the buttock, that's something that we can cure most of the time. Okay, so the answer is yes. Next question we have, uh, can a 95 year old go for therapy for knee and body pains all over at Regan Healthcare? So it's a body pain all over. Uh, answer is must see why. No, not, not, not an unreasonable question. Um, my oldest patients, about 90 something that I treat, um, most of them have relatively good quality of life except for certain specific issues. So the short answer is let me assess first whether we can make a practical difference or not. If you cannot make a practical difference, then you know you find some Tai Chi for Popo or something like that. Lah. But no need to waste because we offer a very professional service. You know, we're very heavily invested in science. We're very heavily invested in equipment. So we're not the cheapest treatments in town. If we don't want to waste people's time and effort. If we can do something for Papa, we'll tell you we can do something. If we cannot, we tell you we cannot. Then you can decide what you want to do. Very good. Okay. Uh, next question we have. Uh, Doctor, some clinic recommended knee jab. I am unsure the exact term, but basically booster to jab into knee to strengthen the cartilage. Based on what I learned from you in the earlier session, we should go through proper diagnosis instead of just one eject. Please enlighten me. Yeah, correct, Lo. Already understand. Teacher give full mark 100%. Pass exam. Right. <laughs> so our 30 years, correct. Uh, get, get assessment first before I go for yeah. an eject. But, but, but Amy, this, this concept of jab to lubricate, right? There's something wrong with it medically, don't you think? It's like saying that every every few months you should go jab yep. to eye to make your eye better, right? It's, That's it's, right. Ill, it's illogical. So it is just that it's relatively good business. So a lot of people do it. Yeah, but um, this frequent knee jab, um, is it, uh, I mean, approved to show to uh, to be like, you know, effective? Uh, probably just a temporary relief, not a long-term relief? 
a very politically sensitive question. Uh. No comment. <laughs> okay, okay, understand. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question we have. Uh, what about squat workout and what are the food for prevention and strengthening? I think this related to uh, knee, knee joints. Okay. The, the, the food for strengthening and prevention is vitamin E. Not the eating vitamin E, the vitamin exercise. Okay, so the correct type of exercise. Um, the problem with knee squats is it depends what you, where you are on this graph here. So I have a guy who is just past 30, like it's about 33, and I see him for recurrent chronic injury because his green line is well over here. He likes to push himself. So, I mean, he's a great customer. Every few months he come and give me business, but you know, I try and explain to him that stop injuring yourself. You're pushing yourself too hard. I repair one area, he's going to spoil something else. I repair one area, he's going to spoil something else. So the answer is when you're exercising, you have to understand where is your green line. If you're exercising above your green line, you will injure yourself. So you, you reduce your green line to somewhere within where your body is so that your body doesn't get injured. Okay. So I, I guess not to exercise over extreme. Not to injure yourself. So if you injure yourself and after you injure yourself, you rise yourself. And then you, after you rise yourself, you go back and you injure yourself again. Yep. Then that's a formula for ending up in trouble, which you yep. don't want. Okay. So just now, doctor, you mentioned um, uh, what vitamin E. E for exercise, huh? yes. or is it vitamin D? E. <laughs> okay. okay. So, so let, let's clarify. Everybody who is attending this talk should go out and buy some vitamin D, the makan one. Okay, okay, right? D. Mm. Vitamin D. And the reason is because vitamin D deficiency is endemic in this country. So if, how many attendees? We have 90, 100, something like that. Yeah, yep. yeah, 87 now, yes. Okay. So let's say you, we had 100 attendees and I do blood tests on everybody. 80% uh, of you will have low vitamin D level. That's what vitamin what we, D we can get from the sun, right? Yeah, but how much sun you get? One to okay, five. Uh, nice more Asian, yeah, with uh, uh, you know exactly. umbrella, big head, and then, and, and then the long sleeve. Last time drive car, must wear long sleeve, wear face shield, then get black people in on eyes. Okay. okay. So, um, vitamin D deficiency is endemic, um, and I kid you not. I mean, I have two teenage children. My teenage girls are on vitamin D as well. Mm. Because last time schooling time different, right? You know, they go out, they're yep. doing it's not home school. Yeah, some sports or, you know, walk in the hot sun, you know, walk here, walk there, do this, do that, right? But now it's yep. all at home only. So they get out of the house so little that, I mean, they go for exercise, they come to my physiotherapy, center for physiotherapy, my elder girl does white tie, like, you know, it's like one, it's probably stronger than me now. But the problem is that they don't get enough sun. So the serious, the, the serious message for everybody here is, go buy and eat some vitamin D, it won't do you any harm. Uh, and it'll usually, for 80% of you, it'll give you some benefit. Okay, that's, that's good advice. All right, I shall get some vitamin D. What about food? Any food of uh, prevention? I mean, our daily regular food. Is there okay. any suggestion what to take more or less? Uh, okay, generally, um, my interest, my, my, my relationship with food is basically listen to your body. So some people will say, you know, I take green beans, my joints hurt. Don't eat green beans or what you want me to do, right? So... Um, that's separate from the subset of people who have high uric acid, right? So that's another one where if you go on to this model over here, uric acid can disturb the synovial cavity by means of causing severe chronic inflammation. Yep. And so I see a lot of people with uric as high uric acid who don't have early joint damage because the inflammation is not very high. So the example I always give is, let's say that you take a, uh, you're going to boil, you're going to cook some food on the stove. You put it on the thing you put on the stove, you put the fire to minimum. If you leave it overnight, next day burn already. Yep. Right? It, even though the fire is small. And that's part of the problem with gout is that mm -hmm. it causes chronic joint damage when people don't recognize it. So generally, my patients who have high uric acid, when I see them, I assess their joints very carefully for damage. And then I try as far as possible to reverse the damage. And then I put them into this model and I ask the GP to look after this stuff here. Okay. 
So it's actually the food that we take, we need to be very um, careful, you know, in case it contributes to a high uric acid. Right. If you already have, if you're, so uric acid, the tendency can be genetic. So if you have a genetic tendency to high uric acid already, that means mm -hmm. that your body produced too much uric acid, then the amount of uric acid you take in should be yeah. less. Correct. Okay. Well noted. Um, next question that we have. If the toe of one leg is pointing outward when walking, does it need correction before it leads to injury and pain of the leg? Okay. Think, yeah. So let me go back to Auntie's picture. Uh, let me see. I think I got another picture somewhere. Let me just find it. Yeah, this picture over here. Okay. So there's a. If you say that you are walking and your toe is pointing out, the whole foot is rotated out. That condition is called tibial torsion. I spell it for you, T-I-B-I-A-L, tibial, then torsion, T-O-R-S-I-O-N. It means that this bone actually has a degree of bending in it. And it's usually depending on which side you're sleeping in your mother's womb. So in this lady's case here, her right leg, she was sleeping in her mother's womb on the right side because the right leg has a high tibial torsion. The left leg is relatively straight. This is a situation where the physiotherapist can help by correcting you at your buttock level by turning the foot in at the buttock to correct the rotation of the toe. And that's actually a, a, a good biomechanical thing to do because it then prevents future problems around the knee. Right. Okay, so uh, our next question is, um, if there is thinning in the cartilage or meniscus up to 25%, is physio enough or is additional treatment required? Um, good question. Let's, so what you're asking me is my, ta, my car tire, the trade makan by 25%, yep. uh, okay or not okay? Answer is it depends why. If the issue is that your alignment is very bent, then you will lose the 75% very fast. If your issue is your alignment is good, then your 75% are a long time. Then you just repair your shock, then you just recondition your shock absorber. Okay, so um, physio would probably go there first to get assessed to see yeah. whether, okay, so yes the, for now. Part, part, of any, part of the problem with physio is that insurance don't pay if you go physio directly. That's right, so, unless so it's due to accident. Unless it's due to accident. So a lot of the time I will assess people, give them a proper understanding and then send them to physio. Then with my referral, they can claim the physio, which, you know, I think it's a bit, the, the industry has its reasons for doing that to prevent abuse. Yep. But you know, the flip side is that it makes it a bit more inconvenient for people who genuinely need care uh, to be able to access it. Yeah, that, that's right, in, in a sense, correct. Um, next question that we have, uh, how about back or spine area pain? Does Dr. Rajis treat this type of pain? Uh, yes, I do, and I do an assessment. First, the assessment is largely physical. You know, just like this one knee picture can give us a lot of information. There's other spine type assessments I can do that give us a lot of information, more so than MRI. Uh, you know, I just share with you, I have a lady, she is very tall um, from Penang. Um, she lives in KL now. And she has an MRI that clearly shows that she has very severe compression of the nerves in her spine. And the only treatment for that is major surgery. But she says, that's not my problem. My problem is that the side of my buttocks on my hips hurt, which is a separate problem. And nobody had ever addressed that problem for her. So, you know, when I fixed the problem that she came in for, yeah, nerve compressed in the spine, she's willing to live with it because the consequence of her not treating it is a bit of incontinence. She's 70 something, she can put up with it, but the potential risk of her treating it is paralysis, which you don't want, yep. right? So you have to really be clear with the back in particular, what is the problem and what is the symptom and are they interrelated or not? A lot of the time you find that whatever problem you see on MRI is not causing the symptom. And you can only do that with a sophisticated physical examination. That's why my physios' hands are as good as mine. I train my physios myself. What I don't know, my physios train me. I'm very happy to learn. So they have certain skill. I have certain skill. There's one of me, there's 12 of them. Of course, I can learn more from them. So same knowledge I give them, 12 people give me 12 different knowledges. So then I improve even further. 
uh, Regan has been uh, well known. Uh, we've got a lot of positive feedbacks of uh, clients having a very good uh, physio session there. Yeah, Thank some you. clients are really, really happy. Uh, we have uh, someone asked about a rice chart again. Uh, just now, Dr. Shed, uh, those who are unable to get that, uh, perhaps uh, you can approach us, uh, those who invite you, then we will share with you uh, a screenshot of that. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, we have a few similar questions about back spine pain. Does Dr. Treat this pain? So, answer is yes, yes. Okay, what about treatment for spur on one side of shoulder? It okay. has been painful for a while, yes. Okay, so let's go to which came first, the chicken or the egg? Okay, that's the question. Let's refer here. Lah. Um, no, lah. let's refer to this. The spur is a secondary change, in my opinion. In my opinion, in my experience, the spur is a secondary change. You have to ask yourself, what is going on here? 90% of the time in the shoulder, you can fix it without shaving off the spur. And that's one of the other things we don't do. So lots of people will say, for shoulders, you need to shave off the spur. Mm. Yep. For us, you don't need to shave off the spur. All you need to do is you just need to make sure that you get the image guided procedure done correctly. There you go. So this is an effort where these tissue layers are stuck together. Because these tissue layers are stuck together, this bone is going up and this bone is banging another bone and making a spur. If I separate the tissue layers, this bone don't bang the other bone. From your perspective, no pain. From my perspective, the spur is irrelevant. Okay. All right. So get access, get assessment to yep. find out the uh, best possible um, treatment. Yeah, and where you get the most out of it. This is most important. I think I love this part that how we can have, you know, minimal uh, invasive treatment, but have that, you know, the big U. Yep. Okay. Uh, next question that we have, uh, Doctor, I have persistent feelings of tension and tiredness from my thighs down to the calves and feet, especially after sitting down for long periods. I feel relieved by massaging my toes back and forth. What is the cause and the treatment? Uh, difficult. I need to know how old you are, what your occupation is, whether you've got any medical issues, and I need to do a physical assessment. Just, just like that, no clear, no clear cause. Lah. Okay. All right. So make an appointment to see Dr. Rajesh. <laughs> Next question. I am a 54 female, had a fall about two years ago, x-ray review as ligament tear and was treated for knee guide and some painkiller. However, until today, the knee aching was persistent and sometimes it's very painful. May I have some expert opinion and advice so I can enjoy pain-free? Exactly here. Injury cause loss of function and deconditioning cause secondary changes. Your secondary changes now are scarring of tissue layers. You force yep. the tissue layers to work and then you get inflammation. Then your episodic inflammation causes more scar. Then the more scar causes more inflammation. So this is very common because when you had the injury, Somebody had to make a decision, do I put you in a cast or do I move you? And if you don't have expert physiotherapists, if you don't have people who know exactly what the problem is, ligament injury on x-ray, a little bit plus minus. Lah. You know, you would sort of, you, you probably not such a direct view of the ligament injury, right? So I would, I would treat you with a minimally invasive procedure followed by guided physiotherapy and optimize your medical problems. I'm pretty confident we can resolve your symptoms. Okay, that's great. All right. Um, next question. My mom's left knee become uh, very stiff and numb after sitting for two, three hours. What is the possible cause? This is quite similar uh, with the earlier question, right? Where the person has a, a numb as well, numbness as well. Yeah, but you have to be a bit more clear about the numbness, the English numbness or the Chinese pay or ma pay or, you know, sort of the, the, the words, the words are actually quite important. The, they are equivalents in English, right? So the word, the, the, the English word for ma pay is nulliness. Oh, okay. I I thought, yeah, I think mine also numb and ma pay is like, you know, ma pay is like this a little, um, right. like a needle, needle prick. All right. Yeah. All right. So that's called nulliness. So the English word for that is nulliness. The medical word for that is dysesthesia. Um, the Chinese word for that is papi, as you know. Um, commonly, that comes from a nerve, which is not shown here, a nerve entrapped between some tendon layer. That one, easy to find on ultrasound. You know, the, the, the problem with ultrasound is basically the software. And the software is here one software, not the computer okay. software. So 
um, I've been doing this since the year 2000, which is 21 years now. And so my experience with looking at things is very, very high. And sometimes when I, the, the problem with this is it's, it's like, um, one of my physiotherapists said to me, it is like surfing, right? It is a skill. And sometimes some surfers are very good because their skill is high enough to keep up with the biggest wave. Others, their skill is so poor that they keep falling off the wave. Yep. So I just find that with musculoskeletal ultrasound, just by luck, I'm always at the crest of the wave. Something new comes, I can find my way to the top of the wave. Something new comes, I can find my way to the top of the wave. Yep. So, and that skill is something that when I pass to my physiotherapists, when I train other people, there are one or two guys who can surf better than me now. You know, um, and I say to them, if you weren't working for me, you're a liability. <laughs> but the fact that you're working for me, you're an asset. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, we just have to find out more and then go for field therapy. Next question is, are the treatment also applicable for neck and shoulder, upper and lower back pain? So I think, yes, Regan yes. and Dr. Rajas has that. Uh, earlier, we have a question as well uh, to treat lower back. Doctor, yes, he does. Uh, actually, last question of uh, in our chat box. Doctor, do you do sclerosis recovery procedure without operation for um, teenager with 15 and 20%, no operation needed per assessment by orthopedic? Any recommendation of improving the condition? Um, okay, so the, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, one of our physios has a particular interest in scoliosis and management of scoliosis. The thing, though, is to be realistic. Scoliosis is a deformity of growth. If you're not growing anymore, you cannot correct it. You can manage it, but you cannot correct it. So you have to be very realistic. The ideal time to correct scoliosis in children is when they hit their growth spurt. So you just monitor. If the child has a mild scoliosis, you're thinking, treat, don't treat, treat, don't treat. You wait first. When they're about to hit their growth spurt, then you bring them for intensive physio. That's your best yield again because you spend the least money and you get the most results. All right, hope that answered the question for our attendee. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of our attendees that uh, raised her hand. Okay, Esther, if you'd like to speak with Dr. Rajesh, you can unmute yourself to speak. Or maybe she accidentally uh, in raised her hand. Okay, so thank you so much, Doctor, for sharing with us today. Uh, today has been a really, um, to me, it's really mind-opening Okay, and also uh, mind blowing. Uh, I've learned so much because we have so many clients and also family uh, members who actually had a knee uh, condition. Okay, including my uh, mother in law had knee condition as well. So we have good news, okay, uh, to share today is that um, Regan, being so generous today, um, they are offering free consultation for all our guests that are attending today. So, yeah, so um, make your appointment. Uh, to see Dr. Rajesh, okay, or a physiotherapy, all right, uh, with a vegan a healthcare, okay, and then by telling them that you have attended part of today's uh, talk, okay, to get your uh, free assessment, all right. So you can take a picture for this. If not, later uh, we are uh, our Pioneers Financial Services uh, members will send this to you, all right. Okay. So uh, next is our feedback form. I want to say a huge thank you to uh, Dr. Rajesh and also to Regan uh, marketing team, Ravinda, who's here with us today for um, sponsoring today's talk and uh, informing um, so many wonderful knowledge and so answering all questions that we have today. I'm sure it's very beneficial to all that have attended today. So give us a feedback. Give us all your um, good words for feedback because all our feedback will be uh, sent to Dr. Rajesh okay, uh, after today. All right. So um, here is a little bit of uh, Regan Healthcare. Uh, you can go to their website. You can uh, look for them. Uh, the, to make for appointment, you also can search for their button to uh, make an appointment. I can message them, all right, to chat with them. And also follow them in their social media. So I found them in, uh, in Instagram. Okay, follow them uh, for all further other information. Okay. And uh, so Prudential is part of our partner from the Pioneers Financial Services. We represent Prudential, Assurance Malaysia Berhad, and also Prudential based in Takafu. Uh, Prudential have recently launched Poor All Care that covers 190 types of illnesses. Okay, and it uh, comes together with a uh, comprehensive uh, critical care, mental health care, and also post-surgery recovery. Yeah, some of our clients who have uh, been through uh, major surgery, uh, this will actually help with the uh, post-surgery recovery um, for the additional uh, income. Okay, so speak with us, approach us if you'd like to find out more. 
Okay, so our next talk is actually on the 19th of January, uh, 16th of January. So we have been doing this for the past uh, 28 times. Today's our 28th episode. I want to say uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your support, uh, for being with us on every month. Um, it's my has been our pleasure uh, to host uh, fantastic speakers, uh, doctors, uh, okay, like Dr. Rajesh to share. All right, and we continue to go strong for next year. <laughs> okay, so next year, 2022. Sorry, there's a typo. Huh? Okay, so it's January 2022, Sunday, 3 p.m. So register and uh, our uh, co-host, our team member will inform you once we have a topic and speaker and a date that's confirmed. Okay, so my name is Amy. Uh, this is a link that you can uh, scan that it has uh, access to um, my contact uh, by social media and Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn. Okay, stay in touch because as, uh, I, will, I will update okay, my social media uh, pages regularly. All right, so the team that support uh, the uh, talk on a monthly basis. Okay, uh, we are called the uh, Pioneers Financial Services. We provide a total financial service, insurance, takaful, investment, and estate planning as well. So speak with us if you'd like to find out more. Okay, so with this, we will end today's session. Thank you once again to everyone. Have a fantastic rest of a Sunday. Uh, stay safe. Okay, and I will see you again um, next month. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you. Thank you.